what's the live music scene like uh, in general in, in, in healthier times it, where you are in Japan? Oh, extremely healthy. I mean, in Tokyo, there are hundreds of little clubs, little pubs, and bands are playing all the time. It's hard to know where to go. I mean, you've got the full range. This is an enormous city, so you've got the full range from stadium gigs to theater gigs to clubs to holes in the wall. You know, a tremendous amount of live music goes on here all the time. And, you know, Japan was a place where a lot of major bands who are doing a world tour would often come here to start to sort of uh, test out the gigs and warm up for the actual rest of the tour. Like we'll do Japan first. <laughs> and and a lot of major bands came here. You know, I've, I've seen REM and, yeah. oh God, I can't remember who else, but um, loads of great bands come here. So, you know, it's a fertile place I, I, for music. I, I, I told you before we started, but my good friend, really one of my best friends, uh, I spoke to him this week, I don't speak to him that often, but it's nice to talk to him. He's based in Bali, but he's done a fair amount of travel. He worked in the IT industry, as a, whatever he was. But he absolutely loves Japan. He just uh, He's just something about Japan. As someone who's lived there for such a long time, what, what is special about Japan for you? Oh, where do I start? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I felt totally at home here from day one. And I'd come with very little knowledge of the place. I just thought I'd give it a shot. And as soon as I stepped off the plane, I felt really good. And um, well, I mean, there's the obvious things like politeness, cleanliness, high technology everywhere, you know, safety. I mean, I never lock my bicycle. I often don't lock my front door. <laughs> I'll go to a supermarket and if I'm carrying a heavy bag, I'll just put it down somewhere and go around and get the food and then pick it up when I leave. That sort of thing is incredible. Yeah. I mean, the, just the amount of trust that you can have here, as opposed to most other countries where you've got to watch your wallet, you know? Yeah. Um, my, my mate Colin was saying in Bali, he, he speaks a little bit of Indonesian, uh, well, a fair bit of Indonesian probably these days, but he said he's. Yeah some indonesian people and he was sort of you know during the kind of the pandemic thing that you know how are you how are you getting on and the, the feeling he had from everyone he spoke to which sounds not dissimilar to what you're saying is the, the spirit that ran through the bar and these people was well we'll get through it together you know we're all in this together let's get through it together right. don't, yeah yeah i don't seem to pick that up where i live so much don't you yeah well i know there are certain countries where a lot of people are resisting you know they don't they don't want to wear masks and they don't want to get vaccinated and all that sort of thing mm. which i find stupid um but here i mean for example 10 years ago just last month 10 years ago there was a huge earthquake and tsunami and the nuclear plant was damaged the whole thing right a triple whammy and everything came to a halt. I mean, there was no electricity, no phones. And sometimes in some countries when that happens, people could just go out and start looting. So, right, let's go. Break a window, take what I've always wanted, boom. And there was none of that here. And people were helping each other. Um, I mean, right almost outside my house is a very big main street. And a lot of people go home by bus or train if you like on that and there was none no buses no trains people were walking home it took people up to six hours to walk home yeah. and it was like um you see film of you know hundreds of immigrants walking to another country mm. and it was like that people peacefully walking no panicking no fighting no looting quietly going home helping each other all the convenience stores were offering their their toilet their phones some of their phones were working oh. sometimes giving away free water oh. you know i mean that to me was the newest thing i've had to a, a wartime experience and when you suddenly see the whole country come together yeah it, may, it really makes you think you know and so this country is of course very homogenous mm -hmm. and there are some people, honestly, who don't like foreigners here. But I, I've never had a problem with that. So, and, you know, it's like this country is like they call themselves the big family. We're the big family. And it kind of feels like that. 
So, so you may, you may, I don't know what, you, what your response would be to this question, but you, you kind of made me think about this. So what's your perspective, you know, as someone who's traveled a lot and spent a lot of time in Japan on kind of Brexit and Britishness and all that? I think it's rubbish. I mean, nationality to me is rubbish, frankly. I don't feel English. And I think um, traveling the world does that, as, as they say, a corny old thing, right? Broadens your mind. Yeah, yeah. You just, just feel, yeah, well, I'm, I'm a human being. First, first and foremost, I'm human. Yeah. And uh, I just don't understand. The whole thing is a vast mistake. Brexit, as far as I'm concerned. And it's going to, be, it's going to have catastrophic effects. Just stupid. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm not arguing with you. I totally, I totally agree with you. I yeah. absolutely, totally agree with you. And I, I think there are already uh, indications of it starting to to implode. But it's, it's kind of um, there's something in, innate that kind, that kind of, you know, um, you know, the Britain, Britain, you know, we're, we're the you know, save the pound and all that, all that kind of that kind of innate sense of, um, uh, I suppose uh, elitist, almost you know Britishness, which which yeah. self defeating actually. I think. Well, it takes centuries for habits to die out. You know, we had the British Empire, so we were like king of the world for a long time. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's old habits die very very hard unless you just get out there and travel. Which which you did. Then you just let go of that all that. It's rubbish. Yeah. yeah. Just go see the world. It's not that difficult. Um, but yeah. briefly, I mean, you, I've got some of the places that you you went to, and uh, yeah. the, the most notable one for me. I mean, you went to Belgium, and then you you obviously spent some time in the States. But the most interesting one to me, I suppose, uh, is India, uh, and you know what you originally maybe thought that would. Uh, you know, give you and, and bring to you and, and what the experience was actually like. Not that dis dissimilar to the Beatles, really, you know. Mm. Went there, I went there to meditate, specifically. So it wasn't a holiday. I wasn't just touring around. I've never been very good at holidays, actually. Mm. I'm not that good at saying, oh, there's an interesting building. Oh, there's a nice museum. I mean, you know, if I'm in a place, like I've been to like many, many towns as a, a, a musician. If there's a day off, yeah, then I'll go and have a look at what's interesting there. But for a holiday, I'm not a tourist. I want to I go do something in particular. It might just be sit on a beach. But in, in this case, there was more to it than that. And it wasn't a holiday. I actually wanted to get away and have a different experience of life because I've been up to my eyes in music for 12 straight years basically without a break and miniatures was almost the sort of peak of that it was a tremendously complicated project and fun though it was it was also a lot of hard work yeah and i just sort of thought all right i need to go and be with me for a while and i'd already started getting into meditation so i thought well i'll go and do it more intensely and uh, see how that goes and so i went to india and it was a fantastic experience i mean it's the first time I've been to a third world country where things really are different, where the sky is a different color and there are different animals walking in the street, like elephants, you know, in between the traffic and things like that. And it was fantastic to see a completely different country and to see the, to see the joy that there is. People, the people were very joyful. As poor as they were, they were having loads of fun. Yes. They were begging, but they were having fun with it as well. I mean, it was a hilarious, hilarious com contrast to come back from that, you know, quickly, you know, a 12 hour flight and then boom, I'm standing on Victoria Station with my suitcase and I'm looking around at all these miserable people and they're all well dressed and smart. Yeah. And they're coming out from work and they, there's so much serious faces in London commuters. I nearly burst out laughing. I thought, if you'd been where I was 12 hours ago, you know, you, so, you know, it's just experiences like that. But it, I mean, you can't make you look at life differently, you know. 
you, you can't buy spirituality, can you? you? You know, it's you know, it's just not it's not available on a shelf, is it? Well, it's all about what. No, but it's good to commit yourself to something, study it, investigate it. Yeah, I take what you can out of it. Yeah, I mean, spirituality. I don't use the word really, and I never so have done. Being kind of warmth and kind of you know, uh, uh, sort of a yeah, a warmth of spirit, really, I suppose, and a, you know, a joyful life sort of thing. Well, you just become more of a human being. I think the more life you see, yeah. the more it melts your borders, it melts your prejudices. You realize a lot of your knowledge was, was borrowed and it's not really worth hanging on to. So, you know, um, yeah, I, I, I'm not one for any kind of particular genre or philosophy or something like that. When I came here, people asked me, have you, have you studied Japanese music or have you studied Japanese calligraphy or martial arts or all these things that you could do here, which a lot of people come to do. And I've done none of that, but I've just immersed myself in this very interesting, different culture and picked up ideas and picked up attitudes from that, you know, like, for example, modern art. I mean, modern art, we invented it, we think, about the beginning of the 20th century. Suddenly, everything got avant-garde. Well, the Japanese have never bothered with that because they've never done natural art anyway. They've never done logical art with perspective that looks like reality. They never even bothered with that. If you look at old Japanese art, it's just a few brush strokes and a lot of white space. So it's a whole different way of thinking um away from this like dichotomy of like well there's logic and then here's avant-garde like we'll just dispense with both of them and live a freer life more in touch with nature more in touch with intuition mm -hmm. the way they speak is like poetry mm -hmm. many words are left out um it's very musical sounding language there's just so many things there's so many aesthetic things here that that I just absorb and I think I absorb because I'm naturally lazy <laughs> so I don't like get down to book work and study I did when I was a kid but you know I realized that you just immerse yourself in something because it's exactly what I do with music you immerse yourself in it and that's where you learn that's how you grow and you I mean I don't practice the piano much you know I stopped that when I was about 14, I think. Wow. And, and I discovered rock music. And so that was it for me. I would just listen to records for hours every day, all kinds of music. Mm -hmm. And I just absorbed something and somehow I got what I needed. And you know what? That's how all children learn anyway. Before they go to school and have, you know, they get everything force fed. I mean, it's amazing just how children learn to speak. Yes. Because most parents don't really take that much time to teach someone how to speak. Uh, no. And when you think of the massive amount that's involved in learning, especially English, yeah. all those words, all that grammar, they just pick it up. It's incredible. Yeah. I, when I, you I, think about it. You know. Yeah, I, I've not thought about it that way before. But I, 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 you know, I got two daughters. I didn't consciously teach either of them to speak. I encouraged them to read, I suppose, which was good. But yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, get a little bit of guidance, but that's all they need. And I think that's what real education is. Hmm. So, so I picked up a lot from Japan, but more in kind of abstract terms, in just ways of ways of thinking, ways of feeling. And people say that people said your music sounds Japanese sometimes. Huh. Certain certain kinds of my ambient music. Yeah. I've actually composed music for movies, and they said to me. Can you change it a bit? It's too Japanese. Wow. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I've been here too long. Well, what? Wow. That's a kind no, of it's fun. compliment in a way, I suppose. I suppose it is, yeah.